people say, oh, that, you know, you must feel so deprived, you know, not eating all these foods. I'm sure you hear that all the time. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a reason why all spiritual paths just about, you know, have, you know, religions have dietary guidelines and, you know, one, you can eat this, but not that, or certain days of the week or certain months of the year or certain times yeah. of day. Just, and I think whatever the intrinsic benefit of eating or not eating certain foods, just the act of choosing not to eat something that you otherwise can eat makes those choices meaningful. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups, and there we are the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. All right, everyone out there, welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. We are really, really stoked to be here with you today. I'm Dotsie, and I'm alongside Alexandra. And our next guest really needs no introduction. You know him as the father of lifestyle medicine. For over 43 years, he has directed clinical research demonstrating for the first time that comprehensive lifestyle changes may begin to reverse even severe coronary heart disease without drugs or surgery. His work is so powerful that Medicare even created a new benefit category, intensive cardiac rehabilitation, to provide coverage for this program. He directed the first randomized controlled trial demonstrating that comprehensive lifestyle changes may slow, stop, or reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer. His research has also taught us that comprehensive lifestyle changes affect gene expression, turning on disease preventing genes and turning off genes that promote cancer and heart disease. And he is currently directing the very first randomized controlled trial to determine if comprehensive lifestyle changes may reverse the progression of early Alzheimer's disease. His resume continues with seven best-selling books and three TEDx talks, which have been viewed by over 7 million people. And Forbes magazine named him as one of the world's seven most powerful teachers. His latest book, written alongside his wife, Anne, is called Undo It, and we're going to focus on the four main lifestyle changes they speak passionately about in the book. Eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. I first met Dr. Dean at the Sundance Film Festival when the Game Changers film was released. I found him to be kind, self-effacing, intriguing, and funny, and his wife, Wow, wow, she is something special. And I asked her if she would be my new BFF, but she said we could discuss it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Actually, I think she would love that. <laughs> okay, good, it's done. She's gonna have to fight me though. She's gonna have to. <laughs> <laughs> we, can have a, we can have a triad. Okay. Oh gosh, all right. So we are gonna dive in because honestly, we have so much to learn and so much to be hopeful for as Dr. Dean Ornish takes us on a ride to optimum health and happiness. So welcome, Dr. Dean, to the podcast. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Well, we have a million questions, a million and one to be exact. But, <laughs> you know, as I was uh, researching, I, I really... There's not much about little, little Dr. Dean, <laughs> little Dean before he was a doctor. So I'd love to start with what style of upbringing did you have and, and what age were you and how did that, I guess you could call it kind of that aha moment happen um, in the case of, of food and how it functions in our body to, to heal and mitigate disease. Hmm. Okay. Well, I grew up in Texas long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, 
and uh, you know, the typical Texas diet of cheeseburgers and chilies and chalupas and you know meat four or five times a day. But what really transformed my life uh, was when I got suicidally depressed when I was in college. I was at Rice University in Houston, uh, and half the student body, you know, graduated first or second in their high school class. And I felt like I was really stupid. And somehow I managed to fool the admissions committee to thinking that I was smart. And now that I was with a bunch of really smart kids, it was just a matter of time before they, uh, you know, figured out what a big mistake they'd made in letting me in. But I also had what I can only describe as a, as a spiritual crisis, which was that I had this direct understanding that nothing external can really bring lasting happiness. And so the combination of feeling like I was never going to mount anything because I was stupid, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter, uh, I began to feel like, you know, who cares? Why bother? So what? Nothing matters. You know, it just took all the meaning out of everything. And I thought, you know, why don't I just kill myself? I remember sitting in organic chemistry class one day thinking, you know, dead people look like they're peaceful. And I just, I was so agitated. <laughs> I couldn't even sit still. I, I went for a week straight without sleeping, which is enough to make anyone crazy. I couldn't read a headline in a newspaper and tell you five minutes later what it said. And I was all set to do that. But what saved me was that I ran myself down so ragged that I got a really severe case of uh, infectious mononucleosis to the point I literally couldn't get out of bed. My parents got wind that all was not well with their son. So they came down and saw what a wreck I was. And I went back to Dallas with them with the my secret plan was to get strong enough to kill myself, as crazy as that sounds. This was in January of 1973. Um, meanwhile, my older sister, who had been kind of a child of the 60s, had really benefited from studying with a, an ecumenical spiritual teacher named Swami Satchidananda. He opened Woodstock, by the way, just was one of his, how he first became uh, well known. And um, so they, they decided they were going to have a cocktail party for the Swami because it really he'd really helped my sister a lot. And you can only imagine in Dallas in 1973 how weird that was. I mean, today it would be weird, but especially, you know, back then, almost 50 years ago. And um, uh, so in walks this uh, central castings idea of what a Swami should look like, uh, you know, long saffron robes and long white beard and, you know, look like, you know, there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And that was certainly true for me. And so he came into our living room and began to give a, a satsang, a lecture. And he started off by saying, uh, nothing can bring you lasting happiness, which I'd already figured out, except I was ready to do myself in and he was glowing. I'm thinking like, what am I missing here? Yeah. And he went on to say what probably sounds to many people like a new age cliche, but it really turned my life around, which is that while nothing can bring lasting happiness, the good news is that it's our nature to be happy and healthy uh, until mm -hmm. we disturb that. You know, there are a few genetic exceptions, but for the 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, we are healthy already, we're happy already until we disturb that. And not being mindful of that, and what may be the ultimate irony, we think, gosh, I must be lacking something, if only I had more, whatever, more money, usually more power, more sex, more beauty, more accomplishment, whatever, then I'd be happy, then people would like me, then I wouldn't feel so lonely and isolated. And what I learned from him is that, you know, in the whole advertising industry, for example, reinforces that view of the world, you have to a sense of lack, you have to get something outside you to be happy and healthy. And once you set up that view of the world, as I learned from him, however, it turns out you feel bad, because until you get it, whatever that is, you feel stressful, boy, I hope I get it. And we know that stress comes not just from what you do, but how you perceive the world and how you react to what you do. So the stakes go up, because it's not just winning or losing, it's being a winner or a loser. And if you're a loser, you're going to be miserable and lonely. And if you're a winner, people are going to love you, and then you'll feel great. So the stakes go up, the stresses go up. And so until you get it, it's really stressful. If someone else gets it and you don't, then it really yeah. reinforces this sense of lacking and this kind of zero sum game view of the world. The more you get, the less there is for me. And you only go around once and you better get it while you can, you know, kind of the, the beer commercial way of looking at the world. Um, and uh, if you don't, and, and, if, uh, and if you do get it, there's this moment of like, ah, oh, this is great, I'm happy. But invariably it doesn't last. It's soon followed by either now what, one of the patients in one of my studies later said, you know, um, the, the, I can't even enjoy the view from the mountain I've climbed. I'm already looking over the next one. It's never enough. Uh -huh. I mean, how many times yeah. have we said, Josh, well, I just made $10,000 a year. I, that would do it, you know? And then it was like, well, maybe 30,000 would be a little better. It's just, it, the goalposts keep moving. Or it's not mm -hmm. now what, it's often so what, big deal. It doesn't really provide that lasting meaning that I thought it would, you know? Another patient said, you know, the letdown that comes from accomplishing a goal is so great that I always make sure that I've got a dozen projects going at the same time. I mean, you know, as, a, as an Olympic medalist, so many mm -hmm. of your colleagues have written books about how once they actually achieve that goal, how 
you know, or, or you know, I think it, was, it wasn't uh, Bjorn Borg, it was one of the um, tennis players who married uh, Steffi Graf. Um, well, Andre Agassi. Andre book. Agassi, you know, wrote yeah. a book about the same kind mm -hmm. of thing, you know, that it's either now what or so what. And so it's like, well, maybe this didn't do it, maybe that will. And so the cycle continued. So what he said is that the goal of all these spiritual practices, you know, meditation, for example, is that, you know, the ancient swamis or rabbis or priests or monks or nuns or mullahs or whatever didn't discover meditation, for example, to um, perform better in sports. It can certainly help you do that or to perform better in school or to unclog your arteries or lower your blood pressure, all those things. It can certainly do all those things and help do all those things. They're actually powerful tools for transformation, for quieting down our mind and body so that we can experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being and to realize that the meditation didn't bring you that sense of peace and well-being, but rather it was there already. What it did was to help stop disturbing what was there already. And so then the question shifts from how can I get what I think I need to be happy and healthy and lovable to how can I stop disturbing what's there already? <clears throat> and that's really important. That may sound like you know semantic parsing of words, but the implications are quite profound because if it's out there, then everyone who has what I think I need has power over me. Uh, to be healthy and happy. But if it's me, not to blame myself, but to empower myself, I can do something about that. And then it becomes like, okay, what am I doing that's disturbing my health? And I can change that as opposed to how can I get something that's external to me? So instead of feeling like I had to go to medical school and get into, you know, to be lovable and happy and healthy, I decided I was that way already. I, I could experience that. You know, it's not a, uh, you know, a, a, a concept that you can argue about. It's like, I remember I was, uh, who was it? Jonas Salk said, I don't have faith, I have experience. You know, you have the direct experience that, oh, when I'm feeling more peaceful, then I know that's true. And then I can go out in the world paradoxically and accomplish even more without the stresses and the anxiety that goes along with thinking like, oh, I have to do this to, you know, because so much is at stake. So I went back to school, transferred to the University of Texas at Austin, you know, graduated first in my class, gave the baccalaureate. And I say that not to brag, but to say I experienced both ends of that spectrum. On the one hand, I felt like a total loser, total failure. You know, I just wanted to do myself in. Um, you know, I love watching uh, It's a Wonderful Life, that wonderful uh, Jimmy Stewart movie, because I can really, you know, relate to that, like what the world would have been like if, uh, uh, you know, I think if there's a hell, it would have been seeing what my life could have been like, you know, and my wife, you know, Anne that you mentioned and our two kids and, you know, all those wonderful things that I would have missed out on. I really think that, you know, when you, you, you know, you kill yourself, you know, you lose your body, but you're still you, you just have a different form. Anyway, so when I went to medical school, I uh, was learning how to do coronary bypass surgery with Dr. Michael DeBakey, who was one of the people who invented the operation. And, you know, we'd cut people open, we bypass their clogged arteries, he'd tell them they were cured. And more often than not, they'd go home and do the same things that had caused the problem in the first place, you know, smoke cigarettes, eat junk food, not manage stress, not exercise, et cetera. And then we cut them open again, sometimes two or three times. And so for me, that became the metaphor of what was wrong with traditional medicine. I mean, there's a lot right. I mean, we've all benefited from drugs and surgery that can be life-saving when used appropriately, but we weren't really treating the cause. We were only treating the symptoms. You know, I later I had a cartoon drawn of doctors busily mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing, but nobody was turning off the faucet. It's like, you know, when people get put on medications to lower their cholesterol or their blood pressure and their blood sugar and say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor usually say? Like forever, right? It's like, how long do I have to mop up this floor? Like forever, like, well, why don't we turn off the faucet? Why don't we treat the cause? And the cause more often than not are the lifestyle choices that we make each day. And over years, you know, 40 years now, 43 years, we've used these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. And I think the biggest obstacle I find is people think, oh, diet and lifestyle, that's kind of boring. You know, it has to be a new drug, a new laser, a new device, something really high tech and expensive to be powerful. And we've been able to show how powerful these simple changes are. So I decided to go to these places that used to call libraries and these things called books, you know, that you can, you know, check out. And I began to read and dogs and cats and pigs and rabbits and monkeys, you could cause them to get heart disease if you made them smoke or put them on typical American diet or made them sedentary or put them in isolation. And you could reverse it if you change those things. I said, why should people be any different? And Dr. DeBakey was kind of merciless. He was really old school. You know, he was the kind of guy who would stick your fingers if you didn't move them quickly enough out of the operating field and so on. In fact, by the way, he, and he said, he'd say like, 
He said, what year are you, son? I'd say, I'm starting my third year. He goes, man, it's gonna be so much harder to bust you out of here now with all these weird ideas you have. And he called me actually about, I don't know, three or four years ago at the age of 99. Wow. I hadn't heard from him in literally decades. And he said, hey, Dean, this is Mike DeBakey. And he had a very uh, distinctive Louisiana accent. So I recognized it immediately, although I hadn't heard him literally in decades. And I said, to what do I owe this great honor? He said, well, you know those ideas that I used to give you such a hard time about when you were my medical student? I said, oh yeah, I remember very well. He goes, that's what's kept me alive all these years. He said, I'm 99 years old, I'm about to die. I just wanted you to, I thought you'd like to know that. He said, you know, my wife got interested in your approach and so it's really helped me out a lot. So if you live long enough, you just never know. It's kind of given me a longer event horizon about how change can sometimes, you know, take decades, not just, you know, weeks or years. But anyway, and so I decided to take a year off between my second and third years of medical school, much to my uh, parents' dismay. And, that, you know, there's something nice about not being fully indoctrinated about what's possible and what's not possible. And so I didn't know enough to know what's not possible, you know, fools rush in and all that. And so I went to every hotel in Houston and found one, the plaza that donated 10 of its rooms to us for a, a month. And the chief of cardiology and the chief of medicine, one of the nice things about going to medical school in Texas at Baylor College of Medicine was that there is this really pioneering ethos there. It's like, you got this weird idea, go for it. You know, it may not work, but you'll learn something. So we'll support it, you know. Uh, when I went to Harvard later, it was like, you know, you can't do anything until like you're 40 and, you know, worked in someone else's lab for 10 years. But anyway, um, and so I, I put 10 men and women who had really bad heart disease in this hotel for a month and uh, they got better. And they not only felt better, eight of the 10 people, their chest pain went away. Uh, they were better in ways. We actually had uh, a test, which was a new test at the time that measured called a thallium scan <clears throat> that measured blood flow to the heart. And we showed that eight of the 10 people showed improved blood flow to the heart. And I, I showed this to the doctors and I said, hey, isn't this wonderful? They said, oh, well, you know, that must not be, you, the, the test must be wrong. I said, what do you mean the test? Well, these are, you did the test. These are the same tests we send people to bypass surgery with every day. Why are they suddenly not working? Well, you didn't have a randomized control group for comparison. How do you know they wouldn't have gotten better anyway? I said, well, technically that's true, but have you ever seen any patients get better like this? Well, no, but that's beside the, you know. Anyway, it was my first understanding that when you're doing something that's truly really disruptive, that really challenges the conventional wisdom, it's often met with a lot of resistance. It's very threatening, not only threatening in the sense that people think, oh, drug companies and you know losing money, but it's really threatening in a much more primal way. The order that that system provides kind of gets shaken a bit. So anyway, went back to school, finished medical school, then did a second study, took off another year. And this time we did have a randomized control group. We replicated those findings, published it in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I went to Harvard and Mass General to do my medical fellowship and residency, moved to San Francisco began the third study, the most definitive one called the Lifestyle Heart Trial, became a, a professor at UCSF and started the nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute. And uh, we use the, you know, again, these state-of-the-art measures, quantitative arteriography to measure the amount of blockages in the arteries, very accurate and reproducible and precise, and cardiac PET scans, positron emission tomography, to measure how much blood flow the heart was getting. We actually flew our patients to Texas, the University of Texas, which had the best cardiac PET scanner at the time. Went to great lengths to do the study. And um, it was also my first real direct understanding that when you're doing something that's really disruptive, it's hard to get funding for it because there's a catch-22. People think like, why should we waste our money? We know it's impossible. And without the funding, you can't do the studies to show it's possible. And if they don't think it's possible, they don't want to fund it. So I said, look, and we, I'd raised some money from some people in Texas who were in the oil and gas and uh, real estate development world. And, and at that time, uh, oil plunged and the people couldn't make their pledges. And so they said, you just can't do the study. So I talked to my staff and I said, look, uh, I don't know how we're going to raise the money, but if you're in, somehow I really have this mystical idea that if you're totally committed to something, somehow the universe, and you're doing good work, somehow the universe will provide. And we had to raise at that time about $50,000 every month. And sure enough, every month, we, no one ever missed a paycheck. You know, uh, I really think that's true. Anyway, so we found again that after one year, there was some reversal. The arteries became less clogged in the group that made these lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. whereas they got more clogged in the comparison randomized control group, even though they were making, they were following the American Heart Association dietary guidelines, you know, less red meat, you know, four eggs a week, take the skin off the chicken, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't enough to, it slowed down the rate at which they got worse, but that was the best you thought you could do was just to slow it down, not to stop or reverse it. We showed that ounce of prevention, pound of cure, if you will, that it takes, it's hard to reverse a chronic disease. That's why we showed it for the first time in a control study because people didn't go far enough. And then we use that as a 
um, after one year, we then were able to get a grant from the National Institutes of Health from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute to extend the study for four more years. And we found there was even more reversal after five years than after one year, but there was even more worsening after five years than after one year in the control group. And we published the one-year findings in the Lancet, the International Premier Medical Journal, and the five-year findings in the Journal of the AMA. And the PET scan findings, we found there was a 400% improvement in blood flow, which we also published as a separate paper in JAMA. And then over time, um, I, I thought, you know, at the time I thought, well, now that'll just change medical practice. And to some degree it did, but not nearly as much as I'd hoped, because what I learned is that, that science is not the primary determinant of medical practice, reimbursement is. And it's not that we doctors are only interested in money, but if you're <clears throat> trained to use just drugs and surgery and you're reimbursed to use drugs and surgery, that's what you do. It's like, you know, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you see everything is a nail. Uh, that we did a, uh, I'm on the nutrition subcommittee working group of the American College of Cardiology. We published a paper a year, a couple of years ago that the average doctor gets four hours a year of nutrition training, a year. And the average cardiology fellow in four years of fellowship gets a zero. You know, so that's why doctors use drugs and surgery because that's all they know. So I thought, well, you know, if we could get Medicare to pay for this, we got, <clears throat> there were some insurance companies, Mutual of Omaha and Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield and some others covered it. But I thought if we get Medicare to do it, that would really be a game changer because, you know, we doctors do what we get paid to do, we get trained to do what we get paid to do. So if you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and even medical education. So I was working with Bill Clinton, still am, as one of his consulting doctors, but also with Newt Gingrich at the time with one of his family members when he was Speaker of the House. We had, you know, both ends of the political spectrum, people who really did not like each other much at all. You know, we had the most, and we ultimately had 30 members of, of Congress, you know, from the most conservative Republicans, the most liberal Democrats, you know, 15 to 20 senators, you know, across the political spectrum, heads of the ARP, et cetera. And it still took, it took us 16 years. You know, my persistence is probably my, my best and my worst quality. Uh, but after 16 years, they created a new benefit category, as you indicated, uh, to cover our program. And that really was a game changer. And then now that Medicare is covering it, most of the other insurance companies are as well. That was in 2010. And so we've been with a company called ShareCare, where we've been training hospitals and clinics and physician groups around the country. And it's been working. We're getting uh, bigger changes in lifestyle, bigger, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings. We're cutting costs in half in the first year and, uh, and better uh, engagement than anyone's ever shown before, um, which has been uh, exciting. And then we had another breakthrough in November, just a few months ago, when uh, Medicare agreed to cover my reversing heart disease program when done virtually via Zoom. Uh, so now we can reach people wherever they live in the country, not just those living within driving distance of one of the hospitals or clinics we've trained. So that'll help reduce health disparities and health inequities and uh, enabled us to really reach people wherever they live in rural areas or food deserts or whatever. So um, we're at a new era now. If people are interested in learning more about our work or signing up for the, the virtual program, just go to our website, ornish.com. So that was a rather long answer to your question. No, it was fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, we learned a lot in that and I'm so yeah. glad to know about. Thank you, Dotsy, for, for asking that. And then let me just add one thing, which is to me, to me, this has all been kind of a conspiracy of love, if you will, you know, that um, I feel like I've been on bar. I really literally came as close to killing myself as you can without actually doing it. And I've, I know how dark those places can be. They're, in, they're unspeakably dark. And so I, I have really directly experienced that. It gives me a lot of compassion, but also really freed me in a lot of ways, because just as I learned that I could take all the meaning out of life, I later learned that I could imbue my life with meaning. And one way of doing that is by doing things that help other people. Another is by um, not choosing, choosing not to do certain things, you know, choosing to be in a monogamous relationship or choosing not to eat certain foods. You know, people say, oh, that, you know, you must feel so deprived, you know, not eating all these foods. I'm sure you hear that all the time. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a reason why all spiritual paths just about, you know, have, you know, religions have dietary guidelines and, you know, one, you can eat this, but not that, or certain days of the week or certain months of the year or certain times yeah. of day. Just, and I think whatever the intrinsic benefit of eating or not eating certain foods, just the act of choosing not to eat something that you otherwise can eat makes those choices meaningful, you know, or being mm -hmm. in a monogamous relationship. Yeah. Is that like the ball and chain? Well, it can be, or is that, you know, the crucible where you create this sacred space where you, you know, you can only be intimate to the degree you feel you can be open your heart mm -hmm. and be vulnerable. And you can mm -hmm. only do that to the degree 
you feel safe. So if you have people who are totally committed, they can open their hearts more and more. The more intimate it is, the more erotic it is, the more playful, the more fun, the more healing, all the things that really matter to people. And so in all of these areas, what it comes down to is what you gain is so much more than what you give up, not just about preventing something mm -hmm. bad from happening years down the road. That's not sustainable. Fear is not really a sustainable motivator. I mean, for a month or two, it can really get your attention, but it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. What's sustainable are joy and pleasure and love and feeling good. And so for me, my work, and which is, you know, I, I just, it gets me out of bed every day, is to feel like I can work with people who are suffering, just like I was. And when they're suffering, there's an openness to change that you don't usually find because change is hard. But if you're hurting badly enough, and you can say to someone, look, you know, here's something you can do that can make the pain, whether it's the chest pain, you know, the angina or the more deeper pain, the depression or so on, that can really make a difference in how, because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic, how quickly you can experience those benefits. Mm -hmm. And then they come out of your own experience, not because some doctor or some book or some whatever told you, but like, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So let me do more of this and less of that. That really makes it sustainable. And so for me, the reason that I've spent so much of my adult life doing these uh, studies, and they're really hard to do, is that properly done and with the right collaborators and published in the leading journals and so on, they can redefine what's possible. And by doing so, it can give, at this point, literally millions of people new hope and new choices when they're hurting the most and they're the most open to change. With the, 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 the doorway, you know, people say things like their suffering has been a doorway for transforming their lives. And mm -hmm. it's an opportunity that as a doctor, I wasn't really trained to do. I was trained to kill and bypass pain rather than to use that as a doorway. Yeah, I have to say, I can relate to that so much from um, anorexia. When I was coming through that, I really had a desire to not be restrictive about anything in my life ever again. You know, that was, that was kind of the goal. Uh, and as I moved over to whole food plants and, and veganism, so many people said, ah, oh, that's going to get you sick again. You're going to be, you're, you're restrictive. And oh, I just got to say it. It felt the exact opposite because I was now leading with my heart and, and five times a day or six times a day sitting down to eat. It was like this joy was bursting out of me. And I was the one that was in control of that and, and, and creating that space for my heart. And yeah, never, never looked back, obviously. That's, that's really you know, related. I mean, you know, so much of anorexia, as I understand it, you know, way more about this than I do is about control and so much about mm -hmm life in general, you know, when, when I see people say, you know, honey, you know, you're not supposed to eat that, you know, they just like, they immediately want to do the opposite. You know, it goes back to yep. the first dietary intervention, you know, when God said, don't eat the apple and that didn't go so well. And that was God. No, talking, you know, that was, so. And it was Eve's fault, you know, so that's, <laughs> that's really, <right>. so, <laughs> yeah. I just found that even more than being healthy, you want to feel free and in control. And so the idea of doing these studies and this podcast really is just to me, awareness is the first step in healing. So I appreciate mm -hmm. the chance to share this information. Yeah. What, what, let's, can we dive a little more specifically into the lifestyle changes that you suggest to work with people? You've distilled it, as Dotsie mentioned in the intro in your, in your latest book, Undo It, um, into four tenets eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. But can we go more specifically? Because I've heard people say, oh, his program is too restrictive. And so, but, and we're talking about how it actually, opens you up. So can you talk more specifically, eat well, what is the definition of that and moving more? Yeah, the Undoed book that, as you mentioned, I co-authored with my wife, Anne, and partner. We've been working together for 24, 25 years now. Um, begins with a, one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, which is, if you can't describe it simply, you don't, you don't understand it well enough. And so we kind of reduced it down to its essence, you know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Steve Jobs was one of my closest friends for many decades. And he mastered that idea, you know, with the iPhone, you know, he was telling, he would often say to me that he was more proud of what he left out of it than what he put in it. You know, it's like mm. supercomputer, but the interface is so friendly that, you know, a three-year-old could pick it up and use it. And so I tried to, we tried to make the book like that too, that it was so easy. So the eWell well is basically, um, if you're, if you're trying to reverse a disease, it's more prescriptive. It, it, it's the pound of cure, if you will, as opposed to the ounce of prevention. If you're just trying to stay healthy, lose a few pounds. What matters most is your overall way of eating living. So if you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you're bad or you're, you know, there are all these languages that have this kind of fascist 
quality to them. You know, once you call foods good or bad, it's a small step to saying I'm a bad person because I eat bad food. And at that point, might as well just bring out the cheeseburger as you're a bad person, right? But, you know, but if you're trying to reverse a disease, it is hard. Again, that's why we were able to show that for the first time for so many of these different conditions, because um, most people didn't go far enough. So it's essentially a, a whole foods, plant-based diet. It's essentially a vegan diet. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products, as close to possible as they come in nature. It's low in fat, but it's also very low in refined carbohydrates and concentrated sweeteners like sugar and high fructose corn syrup and so on. But as you know, within those, you can eat you know, whenever you want. You can eat until you're hungry. You don't limit the amount of food, just the type of food. And still people lose weight and they come down to what they weighed in high school or college, you know, if that's what their ideal body weight was and they level off, you know, it, it works really well. The, the move more is, you know, exercise. And uh, um, for me to talk to you about exercise would be like, you know, me talking to Michael Jordan about how to play basketball, you know, but, um, or Steph Curry, but it's, uh, it's basically if you, what it comes down to for me is if you like it, you'll do it. So pick a kind of exercise you enjoy. Uh, and for me, I, I grew up in Texas where, you know, running was always the preferred form of punishment, you know, go take a lap, you know, or uh, give me 50 pushups, you know, or whatever. But swimming was always fun. And so we moved into a house a couple of years ago that actually has a lap pool and it's heated, which is such a great luxury. So I've been swimming every morning because it feels like fun for me, you know, as opposed to, I don't have to motivate myself to do it. It's just, you know, fun. So pick something you enjoy or incorporate it into your life. You know, I used to get frustrated when I couldn't find a parking place near the gym. I thought, well, this is ridiculous, you know, so I parked deliberately farther away, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and so it's both aerobic and some resistance training. Uh, the stress less is various stretching, breathing, meditation techniques derived from yoga, but we do it in a, whatever form is comfortable for you. It can be religious, it can be secular, um, but, but it's more, again, more than stress management. It's about, again, quieting down our mind and body enough to experience that inner sense of peace and joy and well-being that's always there. And also to experience our own inner wisdom, our own inner teacher, our own inner guru or inner God or whatever you want to call it. It's that little voice that you know, wakes me up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen, up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest or here's something you really ought to think about. And I've learned that I can access that more intentionally and directly when I can quiet down my mind well enough to hear it because it speaks very clearly, but very quietly it gets drowned out so easily. So at the end of a meditation, I have gotten in the habit of always asking my voice to say hello to me and I'll say hello back. And, and I'll, say to, I'll say, what am I not paying attention to that I need to? and listen, and it'll tell me. In fact, all of the ideas for doing the studies, including the most recent study on the reversing Alzheimer's, which we can talk about more in a moment, came from listening to that voice. So the stress less is not just managing stress better, but rediscovering our own inner sense of peace and joy and well-being and inner wisdom. And the, uh, the love more is the part that people often have the hardest time with initially. They say, okay, I get the exercise, and of course, you got to eat. It's just a question of what, but love more. That sounds so touchy feely. And I'd get really defensive and I'd say, Oh no, look, this is hard science. Look at our, you know, quantitative arteriograms and cardiac positron emission tomography and radionuclide <laughs> ventriculography and spec thou and blah, blah, blah. And then one day I said, you know what? It is touchy feely. And that's why it works so well because we are touchy feely creatures. We're creatures of community. We're that's how we've survived as a species is to learn to love and take care of each other. You know, and that's part of what concerns me today as things get so polarized and, and divisive is that, you know, that's really what, how we've survived as a species is to learn to love and take care of each other. But to me, the real pandemic isn't just, you know, COVID-19 or heart disease or type two diabetes. It's, lo it's loneliness and depression and isolation, which I certainly understand from my prior experiences we talked about earlier. But also, you know, with the breakdown of the social networks that used to provide people a sense of love and connection and community, you know, uh, 40 or 50 years ago, most people had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people who grew up together. They had a job that felt secure that they were, you know, at for 10 years or more, got to know their coworkers. They went to these places called offices, you know, <laughs> they weren't doing it all by Zoom. You know, there was a, a church or synagogue or mosque or club or something they went to regularly where they connected with people. And, and today, many people don't have any of those. And one of the studies that, um, that Anne and I cite in our new book and the Undo It book is that uh, the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are. And well, why is that? It's because it's not an authentic intimacy. It's like, it looks like everybody has this perfect life, but you, you know, it's like, here I am in front of the Eiffel Tower with my beautiful kids and here I am, you know, whatever. And 
but, you know, people don't post their demons and their darkness and so on. Whereas if you grow up in an extended family with two or three generations of people, you know, they really know you. They don't just know your, you know, your Facebook profile or, you know, the nice things you said about me when we, when we introduced me. They know when you messed up. They know when you were suicidally depressed or when you got busted or when you, whatever, broke that window or, you know, and you know that they know and they know that you know that they know and they're still there for you. And there's something very primal about, you know, I see you like in James Cameron's, you know, wonderful film Avatar, which is really from an African proverb. You know, I see all of you. And, 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 and to be seen in all of you, not just your good stuff, and still be loved and accepted is profoundly healing. And so in our support groups, they're not just about helping people stay on the diet, as important as that might be. It's really trying to recreate that sense of authentic intimacy by creating a safe place where people can let down their emotional defenses and talk openly and authentically about what's really going on in their lives without fear that someone's going to judge them or criticize them or blame them or give them glib advice on how they should do things better, but just to hear them and to connect with them. And at first people, it's the, you know, it's the most, people have the most apprehension about it. They, and yet once they do it, they say, they say, well, okay, well, you know, you're a doctor and you've done all these studies and, you know, and I say, yeah, this is really important. And they say, okay, well, I'll do it because you think it's important. But once they do it, and usually on the first or second group, even there, it's so meaningful because again, people, it's such a hunger that we have a primal need for a connection and community that so often goes unfulfilled. You know, it's, it's why, even though people say, oh, it's so hard, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it's people can't do this. We're, you know, um, Medicare is paying for 72 hours of training, which we divide into 18 four hour sessions. So people come twice a week for four hours at a time, either before in person, now we can do it by Zoom. And they get an hour of exercise, an hour of meditation and stress management, an hour of um, a group meal with a lecture, but also an hour of the support group. And the support group is why we're getting 96% uh, of the people finish all 72 hours. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, uh, only about a third of people who are prescribed statin drugs to lower your cholesterol are taking them just four to six months later. And that's just taking a pill once a day. And statins are of proven value for many people and usually someone else pays for it, like insurance. And so you'd think that taking a pill would be easy and everybody would do it and changing lifestyle to this dramatic effect will be really hard and no one would do it. And 96% of the people are doing this after 70, after, um, after uh, um, uh, nine weeks, you know, after 72 hours of doing it. And yet only a third of people are taking their statins. And the reason is that the statins don't make you feel better, but the lifestyle changes do. And so it's taking this pill, it's not gonna make you feel better. Hopefully it won't make you feel worse to prevent something really horrible like a heart attack or stroke from happening years down the road that you don't wanna think about. So you don't think about it. But when you change your lifestyle, you feel so much better so quickly. And that's why I love the Game Changers film that we were both in, you know, that wonderful scene that, uh, that uh, Aaron Spitz did with the three guys uh, and their erectile function, you know, that, you know, he gave them a single plant-based meal and then they measured how the frequency and hardness of erections, these are athletes in their 20s, you know, of erections they had at night when they slept. And then they gave them a single meat, ba a plant-based meal. I think it was a Beyond Meat meal or something. And they measured the same thing. And all three guys had three to 500% more frequent erections and 10 to 15% harder erections after one plant-based meal. So it kind of changes the whole equation from doing something today to prevent something bad from happening years down the road. Like, oh, what I gain is so much more than what I give up you know, and half of guys in their 50s have erectile dysfunction. It only goes up as you get older, 40% of guys in their 40s. But also, it's not just your sexual organs that get more blood flow, your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep, your heart gets more blood, and so on. So because these mechanisms are so dynamic, when you make big changes, paradoxically, and especially if you change a lot of things at the same time, which is also counterintuitive, it's actually often easier because you can then say, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So let me do more of this and less of that mm -hmm. because I'm choosing to do that, as you said before, not because someone's controlling me because what I gain is so much more than what I give up in ways that are really meaningful. Yeah. It, it, going back to a, 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 for a few moments in, in this podcast so far on the idea of self-empowerment and the, the, what you learned from um, the shaman, my favorite... <laughs> line in the game changers was when you talked about um i think which is just one of the most exciting aspects of your work that your research has taught you that lifestyle comprehensive lifestyle changes affect gene expression yeah. turning on 
disease preventing genes and turning off genes that promote cancer and heart disease. Um, and it's because it's so darn hopeful. It, it, it puts us in the driver's seat. It empowers us. It's no longer, oh, uh, you know, Grandma Rose had it, so I'm doomed <laughs> and here we go. Um, yeah. and, you know, and, and we, we think back to, to, to that generation and, and, and you know, and, and their genes and, and maybe it was bad diet, but it was also very high stress, our, our parents that, that survived the war. Um, Take us deeper into that. Uh, I, I don't feel like I ever explain it as well as I want to when 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 people say, you know, Grandma Rose. So yes, would you do that? Yes. Yeah, well, so often people say, Oh, I've just got bad genes, there's nothing I can do about yeah. it. You know, mm -hmm. and so and yet you can, you know, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the only way to change your genes is to change your parents, meaning you can't do anything about it. Um, but we we did a study with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome. And we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months, same lifestyle changes, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes in simple terms. And there are mechanisms. There is something called um, methylation, which is a molecule that kind of acts like a switch that can turn on or turn off a gene. Technically, the genes are the same, but the expression of the genes, if you can turn off a gene that causes cancer, then it's as though you're changing your genes or yeah. what are called different proteins, histone and non-histone proteins, they act as switches and sirtuins and others that turn on and turn off the genes. And we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months. Now, I mentioned earlier that I've been working with President Clinton since 1993, mm -hmm. uh, when, when he first became president. He's talked about this publicly, I wouldn't even mention it. Right. And about 14 years ago, after his bypass surgery uh, his, uh, had clogged up, his cardiologist, one of his cardiologists held a press <sighs> conference on CNN and said, oh, it was all in his genes, his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And having been working with him for so long, I knew it had everything to do with it. So I sent the president an email. I said, look, the friends I value the most are the ones who tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And you need to know that it's not all in your genes. And I say that not to blame you, but to empower you. Because if it were all in your genes, you'd be uh, a victim. And you're not a victim. You're one of the most powerful guys on the planet. And so he began making these changes. And he's still doing it. I communicated with him recently. Uh, he's getting better. And you know, it's it, whatever your politics, I think it's a great example that especially someone who was known for eating you know so much uh, an unhelpful diet if he can do it then anybody can do it but it's it's part of the bigger issue that in the undo it book I, I put forth this new unifying theory that you know I was trained like most doctors to view heart disease type 2 diabetes high blood pressure high cholesterol prostate cancer breast cancer Alzheimer's disease as being fundamentally different diseases different diagnoses and different treatments and yet we found over these four decades that these same lifestyle changes we've been talking about can not only prevent, but often reverse the progression of all of these different conditions. And we're still looking into Alzheimer's um, and something like it's kind of the opposite of this whole personalized medicine trend. Like, why is that? And I realize it's because they're not so different from each other. They all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress changes in immune function, changes in overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, changes in the microbiome, the 100 trillion cells in our gut that coexist with us, and uh, angiogenesis, and so on. And each one of these biological mechanisms, in turn, is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. You know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. And so when you make these changes, and it also helps explain why we find what are often called comorbidities, that the same patient will have high blood pressure and high cholesterol and be overweight and have heart disease and so on, because they all are just different expressions of the same underlying disorder or why, you know, as Colin Campbell showed in the China study that entire countries, you know, like in Asia 50 years ago had such low rates of these chronic conditions until they start to eat like us and live like us. And now they die like us, you know, more often than not with the same kind of conditions that we die from. And so it radically simplifies what we tell people because it's not like there's one diet for heart disease, a different one for type two diabetes or different for Alzheimer's, whatever. It's the same for all of them. And we're now in the middle of doing the first randomized trial to see if we can reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease, which I'm particularly interested in because my mom died of it and all of her siblings, and I have one of the APOE4 genes for it. And you know, when you lose your memories, you lose everything. And unlike these other conditions, they're all at least there are other things you can do if you've got heart disease or diabetes that have benefit, but nothing really works for. Alzheimer's. They're the only, they've had one new drug approved in the last 20 years, and they spent billions and billions of dollars trying to find them. And the one drug that got approved, there's a lot of controversy around called aducanumab because it's uh, one study showed it didn't do anything. The other said it slowed down the rate of getting worse a little bit. 
about a third of people end up with brain hemorrhages and it's $56,000 a dose and so on. And so my belief is that where to place with Alzheimer's is very reminiscent of where we were with heart disease 40 something years ago. In other words, back then, less intensive lifestyle changes slowed down the rate at which your arteries got clogged. We found more intensive ones could actually get them less clogged over time to reverse the disease progression. You know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure. It's hard to reverse disease. It takes a lot to do that. And likewise, the uh, finger study and other studies have shown that less in, the same lifestyle, you know, it's good for your heart is good for your brain and vice versa. Less intensive lifestyle changes can slow the rate of getting Alzheimer's. My theory is, again, that maybe more intensive ones might stop or reverse it. So we're still recruiting the last group of patients. And if anyone out there has early stage Alzheimer's, go to, again, go to our website, ornish.com. We're now, we, we were forced to do the intervention by Zoom two years ago when COVID-19 hit. And to my great surprise, if anything that came out of COVID, it was learning that we could do it by Zoom as well as we do it in person. So now we're collaborating with the heads of neurology at Harvard and Mass General at the Cleveland Clinic. Well, we soon hopefully do it at the Cleveland Clinic, but also we're doing it at University of California, San Diego, at Renown, as well as in the Bay Area, where they're recruiting and testing the patients locally, but we're delivering the intervention from our staff via Zoom. So, and then drop shipping the food team. We're providing 21 meals a week for the entire 40 weeks of the intervention. So you can live pretty much anywhere and be eligible for the study. So I'm hopeful that we can um, show that time will tell uh, whatever we show will be important, but if we can show that we can stop mm -hmm. or even reverse it, that potentially could give millions of people uh, new hope and new choices in an area that nothing else really is working in. So stay tuned. Yeah. I just have one specific question right on that. It, and it, 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 I'm wondering if the answer has to do in blood flow. This is like me pre-asking if I'm right. Um, what would be the difference in a gene expression from a meal of a sweet potato and a blueberry versus a, a cheeseburger? Like what, what will that sweet potato turn off maybe in a, in a precancerous gene? Yeah, I don't know that it's one meal or one item, but a or pattern, ten sweet potato meals know. or twenty, yeah, just like those food differences. Yeah, well, there's there's something called the RAS family, RAS family oncogenes. Oncogenes are genes that promote cancer, and okay. we found that we downregulated those, turned them off uh, okay. in in this study. These are the genes that cause prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, just turned off within three months. You know, whereas we're turning on the genes that. Uh, are, are, are healing. And we also turned off the genes that cause these same biological mechanisms that we've been talking about, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, et cetera, were just you know, turned off. It's to, you know, the thing that continues to amaze me is how dynamic these changes are and how quickly people can get better or worse. We did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that regulate aging. Uh, they're kind of like the plastic tips on the end of your shoelace to keep your shoelace from unraveling. They keep our DNA from unraveling, if you will. And as our DNA replicates over the years, the telomeres get shorter and shorter. And as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter and the risk of premature death from all these different chronic diseases we've been talking about goes up proportionate to that. And she had done studies with Alyssa Apple showing that things, you know, people who eat junk food, their telomeres get shorter faster. So there's people who are under chronic stress, women who are taking care of kids with autism or people who uh, smoke cigarettes or who are sedentary or, you know, whatever, their telomeres got shorter faster. So I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres get shorter faster, maybe good things make them longer. And so she said, no, I don't think so. I said, well, let's find out. So to her great credit, we did a study together and we found for the first time that we could actually lengthen telomeres. Um, and when we published this, the Lancet editor sent out a press release worldwide and they called it first study showing that lifestyle changes may reverse aging at a cellular level. So whatever lens we look at this through, it just shows you, I think it's one of the reasons why a panel of experts from US News and World Report that rate diets every year uh, in January, a few months ago, rated what they call the Ornish diet as number one for heart health uh, for the 11th year since 2011 that they began rating diets. That it's not just heart disease, though, it's all of these different conditions because they're all interrelated. You mentioned you talked about being depressed uh, when you were in college. Is that something that has, was that situational? Has it dogged you as an adult? And if so, how does lifestyle? help depression, if, if not you, but maybe other people, how have you seen it? Yeah, we've been uh, collecting data on everyone who goes through our program. So we have data on well over 15,000 people. And we found that depression scores using a standard test for that are decreased by almost 50%, five zero by half. And you know, that's better than you get with antidepressants. But of course, the only side effects of 
lifestyle changes are good ones. You know, so depression has not been a problem for me because uh, I've, you know, I having kind of gotten as low as you can possibly get, uh, I've learned, you know, not to go to those places. You know, <laughs> I know them very well. They're unspeakably dark. Uh, the worst thing about being depressed, it's truly a reality distortion. Uh, the hallmark of depression, of feeling helpless and hopeless, is uh, this belief that things are bad. They've always been bad. They'll always be bad. And anytime you thought otherwise, you were just deluding yourself. And if there's a power to, to evil, if you will, or darkness, it's to obscure the fact that the light drives out the darkness, you know, metaphorically and literally. And, but the power of darkness is to make you believe that you don't have the power to do that. And so when someone says, only I can save you, you know, or whatever, you know, autocrat or whatever people are saying that kind of goes over to the, the reason it's called the dark side is that the, the power of darkness is to obscure the fact that we have a choice and that, you know, even a small, you know, candle can, can drive out the darkness. You know, we just need to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves that the light is there already unless we, there was a, uh, a spiritual teacher named Swami Vivekananda a hundred years ago who came to the West, who was one of the first Swamis to bring that to this country. And he said, it's, it's as though you cover your eyes and you cry out that you're blind, you know? And depression is like that. It's a reality distortion. You'd really think that that's where the, the hallmarks of depression, the helplessness and hopelessness come from, is the belief that things are bad, they'll always be bad, they'll always, and they were always bad. And the only times you ever thought otherwise, you were fooling yourself. That's the power of darkness. And that's what we try to use our work to help dispel that. And again, what you're doing is to shine a light in the darkness. To me, awareness is the first step in healing and the awareness that we have, that light is already there within us. We just need to stop obscuring it. I was in Costco last night, picking up medicine for my very sick dog. And I noticed in just over, you know, surrounding the pharmacy, every single product seemed to be a product to help a symptom of something. There was um, eye drops for if your you know, eyes are dry or itchy or painful. There was lots and lots of different types of ibuprofens. There was muscular rubs and icy hot and- And acids, right? And Fire. then exactly, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, and it, and I didn't walk any further because I was waiting at the pharmacy, but surrounding me was just everything to treat a symptom for something. And it got me thinking about our conversation today and uh, knowing that that uh, you mentioned your work with President Clinton, his own uh, health, but that you've also uh, worked uh, with Obama and you were on that White House advisory group, uh, Governor Newsom on the um, brain test on Alzheimer's disease prevention and preparedness. And I, I guess I, I'm just, it, it's obviously big business to deal with sick people, big, big business. But what what have you seen change and how much hope do we have uh, for all the work that you've done, 43 years of it. And sometimes I feel like nobody's, no, the doctors that I see, they've never heard of it. They don't know what I'm talking about. What, I wanna talk more hope. Yeah, <laughs> and, no, and, and if you think this advice and these suggestions and the direction that you're talking about to us today are gonna reach the masses. Yeah, well, it's a really good question. You know, 86% of the $3.8 trillion we spent last year in this country for healthcare, which is mostly sick care, are for treating chronic diseases that are often not only preventable, but even yeah. reversible yeah. at a fraction of the cost. We did a study with Mutual of Omaha where we found that they saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year because uh, almost 80% of people who were told they needed a stent or a bypass could choose my reversing heart disease program as a direct alternative, and it was a lot cheaper. Uh, we did a study with Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. They found they cut their costs in half in the first year and by fourfold in the first year when they looked at the subset of people that they'd spent at least $25,000 on in the prior year. So if we really want to make better care available to more people at lower costs, then we need to treat the cause, you know, the turn off the faucet around the sink that's overflowing, which to a much larger degree than I had once depreciated are the lifestyle choices we make each day. And so there, but you know, the, when, 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 as I mentioned earlier, when someone's diagnosed with a life-threatening condition, there's an openness to change that, um, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, well, it may be hard to change, but boy, I'm hurting so badly. Let me try this weird stuff. And then they start to feel so much better so quickly. Their chest pain, again, often goes away. And for someone who can't 
you know, walk across the street without getting chest pain or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work without getting angina or chest pain. And usually within a few weeks, I can do all those things. Um, then they say, well, I like eating junk food, but not that much, you know, because when I gain, it's so much more than when I give up. One of the patients I talk about in the Undo It book is a guy named Robert Troyhertz, who's an internal medicine doc himself. And he had such a massive heart attack that his heart was pumping so poorly that uh, he was told the only thing that could save his life would be a heart transplant. And he went through my program on reversing heart disease that we trained at UCLA for nine weeks to get in better shape for the heart transplant while they were looking for a donor. And his heart disease improved so much in nine weeks, he didn't need a heart transplant anymore. So like, what's the more radical intervention here? You know, getting a new heart or eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Besides the fact that it saves a million and a half dollars immediately, plus another, you know, the fact that you're not on immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of your life. So I think we're at a place where the medical system that is broken, you know, in the same way that it's a crisis, you know, we, it's not sustainable in its current form. Uh, it's going to, you know, bankrupt the GDP, which is too much. And the, you know, trying to you manage care and limit access and ration and so on, it's just not politically viable. And it's not really addressing the, just another form of bypass. We're not treating the cause. And so I'm optimistic by choice, you know, again, having chosen not to commit suicide, I am choosing to be optimistic because so much of that can be self-fulfilling in either direction, but also because I think there's evidence for that. Now that Medicare is paying for this, uh, it's possible for doctors to make a living doing this. Again, if you change medical practice, you change, you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and even medical education. Lifestyle medicine is to me the fastest growing field in medicine today. I think it's the most exciting through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and the Plantrition Conference and other groups like that, the International Plant-Based Nutrition Conference. I, I see a lot of hope here. And I think that, you know, yes, darkness is rising in so many different areas of our lives, politically and otherwise, but so is the light. And I, um, I again, the fact that it took me 16 years to work with Medicare to get them to cover our program, my, as I get older, my event horizon is getting longer. And so I think things actually are moving in a good direction. Are they moving as quickly as I would like? I mean, you have Eric Adams now, the mayor of New York, who's a vegan, you know, who uh, I've worked with. Uh, Cory Booker, who I've worked with, is uh, a vegan. You know, Adam Schiff is a vegan. Uh, you know, some of my uh, uh, favorite people are, are, are doing that. You know, some of the Snoop Dogg, you know, uh, the rapper just came out with a vegan hot dog. It's becoming cool to be eat a plant-based diet. Um, I, I think that um, the, the, the signs are everywhere that um, this is a trend that hasn't even, a wave that hasn't even begun to crest. So it makes me very optimistic. You, you, your Medicare, that's huge, having Medicare cover your program. And Dati uh, and Switch for Good have been working to change the system in terms of the dietary guidelines. We talked about doctors changing medical, the, you talked about the medical system changing how much nutrition they get in school. Are there any other systemic changes because you've worked on these commissions and advisory groups and brain trusts with, with pol political, very high up in politics Where, and subsidies, of course, to dairy companies that, that could change too. Are there any prescriptions you'd give to the government in terms of, or our, our maybe culture as a whole, uh, so that we can systemically change the way we look at health? Yeah, I've been working for many, many years with the government uh, advisory groups and informally and formally consulting with some of the, the, the key leaders on, on both sides of the aisle at the highest levels. Uh, I've also worked with a lot of CEOs of corporations. Back in 1999, I was giving a talk at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and I was introduced to uh, uh, Jim Skinner, who was the CEO of McDonald's at the time. And I said, you know, you've got 43 million customers a day, um, you've got nothing on the menu that's healthy. You're going to be the next big tobacco. So for your own survival, you should have some healthy items on there just so you can say, hey, we're giving people a spectrum of choice. And, you know, for the what they call the veto vote, you know, for the one person in the family that doesn't eat meat, you know, you could give them something so the whole family doesn't go someplace else. So he, he agreed. And so I work with them and we developed these really wonderful salads and they were really quite good. Um, but it was very disappointing because the, because of the subsidies that, you know, the meat is subsidized, the plant-based foods are not, mm -hmm. uh, and they also don't price in the real cost of society. So the salad was five ninety five, dollars the burger's 99 mm -hmm. cents. So if you're on a fixed income, you get a lot more calories for your dollar by eating junk food, which made no sense. So they reduced the amount of salads on the menu to almost nothing. But then I worked with the heads of other major uh, corporations to try to get them to make healthier foods. To some degree that's working, but I think that more and more, you know, there's a, an awareness in the government that 
we need to really look at what's causing this $3.8 trillion in healthcare costs. It is really mostly sick care costs. Uh, you know, I've been working for many years uh, to change the school lunch program. You know, and Neil Barnard has done some great work in that area too. I, I just think that there's, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, $100 billion were spent uh, several years ago for stents and bypasses. The last year we have data on that, uh, that are uh, essentially, there are now eight randomized trials that show that stents and angioplasties in stable patients don't work. They don't prolong life. They don't prevent heart attacks. They don't even reduce angina. They're dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. And yet something as simple as lifestyle changes can actually not only prevent, but even reverse a disease at a fraction of the cost. And as we talked about earlier, the only side effects are good ones. So I think there's more and more awareness of this. And to me, again, awareness is always the first step. So it's taking longer than I would like, but I do think things are moving in a good direction. One of the things I loved about the Game Changers film is that it was kind of like what Elon Musk did for driving with a, with a Tesla. You know, before it's like you had to choose between having a really powerful muscle car that was polluting or this kind of wimpy, you know, Prius. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you can have a car that's faster than a Ferrari that has no emissions at all. You know, and I think the same is true mm -hmm. in the Game Changers film. It's showing that, you know, it's not like, you know, a wimp if you eat a plant-based diet. It actually has just the opposite effects. It makes you, you know, you can beat up people better. <laughs> you know, you can get an Olympic medal at age 39. You can, uh, you know, uh, and, and how quickly those, you know, your sexual performance improves. And so I think there's a growing awareness to get away from these false choices. You know, is it good for me? Is it fun for me? Am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer? You know, mm -hmm. to say, actually, it's both. You can do all of this. Yeah. And also, I, I think we always talk, it's odd that people talk about the restrictions in a plant-based diet, because if you look at folks who eat a conventional, sad diet, uh, standard American diet, they, they don't, I wouldn't wager they eat much more restricted and they choose not to, to indulge in all the wonderful things that we eat. I find that restrictive. Yeah, it's true. Most people eat the same, you know, 14 meals over and over again uh, is what studies mm -hmm. are showing. Mm -hmm. But again, it's uh, to me, the big equation, I used to get into friendly arguments with Al Gore about this when an inconvenient truth came out. I said, you can scare people. And that's a very powerful motivator for like four to six weeks. You know, when someone's first diagnosed with a heart attack, they'll do pretty much anything their doctor or nurse says for right. maybe four to six weeks. And then they stop because we all know we're going to die. The mortality rate is still, you know, hundred percent It's one per person, <laughs> but unless you're suicidally depressed, like I was, or you've just been diagnosed with a life-threatening condition, you don't think about it most of the time. It's just too overwhelmingly scary. And so we tune it out. And so efforts to try to motivate people that are fear-based really are not sustainable, but joy and pleasure and love and feeling good really are. And when people realize that the quality of their life, that what you gain is so much more than what you give up and how quickly within days to weeks you can experience that. That's why, again, I love that scene in The Game Changer, a single meal makes a difference. Then it really changes mm -hmm. that whole equation for so many people. Mm -hmm. And what you've done, you know, and to get an Olympic medal at, at 39 in one of the most challenging sports in cycling, uh, I'm sure there are millions of people out there who owe their lives to you because you've redefined for them why to make these changes. Yes, you'll probably live longer, but, you know, if you told me when I was suicidally depressed, I was going to live longer if I just made these changes, I'd say, yeah. no, you don't thanks. get it. I'm just trying to get through the day like so many people. You know, they'll say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes. You're going to take away my 20 friends? What are you going to give me? You know, or uh, food fills that void or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain or opioids numb the pain. We have an opioid epidemic or mm -hmm. alcohol numbs the pain. We have more people drinking than ever or other drugs numb the mm -hmm. pain or working all the time as a more socially acceptable way of distracting yourself from that pain and loneliness or video games or, you know, a bigger business than movies are, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we've learned that it's not enough to just give people information and expect them to change. I mean, it's, it's not like I say, uh, excuse me, Ms. Jones, I want you to quit smoking. Did you know it's bad for you? They go, well, I didn't know. I'll quit today. It's like everybody knows it's time to pack a cigarette, you know? Right. And so we can't just focus on the information or the behavior, but to work on these deeper issues. And when we work on that level, you know, the loneliness, the depression, the isolation, we find that people are much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working on a, a book right now and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of it is about kind of the deconstruction of the female body from war to peace in the, in the female body. And I've been doing a lot of research and, and, and some writing on thinking on our, our three brains, our, our brain brain in our head, our head brain and our heart brain. Uh, it's an actual little brain in our heart, which I know you know, but I didn't. And, and um, 
the gut brain, uh, which is comprised of uh, up to about 600 million neurons. Um, and so I, I'm very curious about the gut brain because that's what we actually, that's where the food goes right? We'll put it in their mouth, his head, head, heads down to the gut to do all of its wonderful or not so wonderful things, depending on what you put in. Do you think that what we eat, not just how much more we love or, or how, how much more uh, we move or how much less stress, but literally the food that goes in uh, our gut brain has a lot or a little to do with um, depression and sadness or pleasure and contentment. Yeah, I think it's, you know, not even just the gut or the heart or the brain. I think every cell really has its own intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, you know, our bodies will let us know, you know, I mean, yeah. the fact that we're showing 50% reductions in depression and people who make these lifestyle changes more than you get with, you know, SSRIs like Zeloft or, or Xanax, mm -hmm. I mean, not Xanax, um, uh, Prozac are yeah. emblematic of that. And again, there, we're just beginning to learn, you know, we have a hundred trillion cells in our gut, the microbiome that are not really us, that are just kind of, we have more cells that are not us than are us that are residing there. And the proportion of which cells are making up those hundred million really can have a big impact on whether we stay healthy or whether we get sick. And there was a study that came out, actually two studies that came out um, in the last couple of months. One of looking at frontline COVID healthcare workers. There are almost 3,000 mm -hmm. of them in six different countries, including the US. And they found that those that ate a plant-based diet were something like 73% less likely to get moderate to severe COVID. Those on a pescatarian who ate fish were 59% less likely. And those on an Atkins, paleo, high animal protein, keto diet were 400% more likely to get um, uh, moderate to severe COVID. And there was another study that came out in almost 600,000 people at a King's College in London and at Harvard with Walter Willett's group. And they found again, that there was those eating a predominantly plant-based diet were like 43% less likely to get moderate to severe COVID. Now, a lot of people don't know that. And it's important because we now know that even if you're triple vaccinated, you're still only about 80% protected. And so people say, what else can I do to enhance my immune function? Well, this is something that you can do that can really make a big difference. And again, it's because of the gut really controls so much more of our health than we have really given, uh, really understood until recently. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> well, folks, it's in the book, Undo It, a very optimistic and inspiring um, treatise on how we can all get healthier and feel better. And as you said, love is a, a very much a, a part of the book. And um, I know that that's not in a lot of health books that we talk about. So it's really important that people read this, this version, which has been updated uh, to, to, to talk about COVID. Well, thank you so much for your, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share what uh, we've been learning all these years. And thank you for inspiring me and your amazing work. And I hope at least some of this has been useful. If anyone wants more information, just go to our website, ornish.com, whether it's about enrolling in our Alzheimer's study or the uh, reversing heart disease program that's now offered virtually or more about the book or there's all kinds of information on how to change your lifestyle. Everything in there is free. And uh, if I seem overly passionate about this, it's because I've just, you know, it really brings meaning to my life. And so I'm grateful every day to be able to do this work. So thank you for this opportunity. It's an honor, such an honor. And you've been amazing. Hey folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long, does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. 
So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.